Hello and welcome back to Citizen Speak. My name is Garrett Martin. Thank you so much for listening today. I am joined by my friend Ryan and we talk about the New Hampshire primary and other primaries that are coming up in the country. Clinton uh, now only leads Iowa uh, over Sanders by 0.25% after the uh, Democrats had reviewed the results of it. And... uh, I mean, she was ahead by 2 or 3%, and now it's only down to 0.25%. And they're still reviewing some of the precincts. I think that there's still the 12 missing precincts, unless they've found them. Um, but, I mean, it's virtually a tie for Clinton in Iowa and Sanders as well. Um, but New Hampshire, uh, Sanders, it's looking like he's going to win it because that's a 13-point lead over Clinton. Um, unless... Sanders does something that's really off the wall. I don't think that Clinton can really come back and win New Hampshire. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I just saw um, I th- it was some newspaper poll, but uh, the lead was down to seven points. Mm-hmm. But who knows if that's an outlier or not? But I think uh, Nate Silver at five thirty eight still has his chance at winning at ninety nine percent. So I think he's definitely going to win it, but. <laughs> Yeah, the the margins I think will affect the narrative though. Right. If he, um, if he, yeah. No, you're fine. Um, the one thing about the polls that I don't like is how they do the polling. It's typically you have to have a a house phone in order to receive the phone call to yeah. to vote for it. So a lot of the young people aren't in there voting. So I mean that's one of the reasons why the polls are so off in Iowa, is that well not a lot of young people have house phones. And Bernie Sanders voters came out in droves and helped make it virtually a tie so far. So I think that him showing that he's 13 points above Hillary Clinton in New Hampshire alone will make it a lot higher, I think, come uh, Tuesday when voting happens. Yeah, that's a very good point. It could, well, the margins could be even bigger than the polls. Right. Um, But, like, the one thing that Sanders really has going for him is Saturday Night Live. Uh, just yesterday that went really well for him yeah um i mean he's buzzing on twitter today uh well except for the super bowls definitely trumping everything and that's the one thing that really upset me about when the iowa results came out is they had so much time to go in and review the the results to try to find the missing precincts to get this all hashed out and they wait until Super Bowl Sunday to release it. Mm. So now there's very little coverage on how Clinton is at a virtual tie with Sanders in Iowa. And tomorrow, everybody's just going to be talking about the Super Bowl and the commercials. And then New Hampshire comes. So this is just a tiny little blip on the radar to only people who are paying attention to it. Yeah, to be honest, I hadn't even heard they had released those official results. I, I do think, though, that even before that, people had, or at least the media narrative was that it was almost a virtual tie, which yeah. obviously benefits Bernie a lot. Yeah, it really does. I mean, he came back from, you know, being at like 3% nationally yeah. towards Hillary Clinton to now uh, Quinnipiac shows him where he's almost tied with Hillary. He's down by like six points, I think it is. No. Um, what is it here? No, and I think uh, yeah. Back onto that Serenade Live thing, I think that's really interesting. I think it encapsulates kind of their campaign images perfectly because they've done think positive things with Hillary before. Yeah, but it was interesting in Bernie's part of like the sketches and stuff for like reiterating his talking points, even if kind of like poking fun at him. Right. But I still, I think that highlights that his campaign has a driving like ethic or point, whereas Hillary's like the biggest positive driving point is that she's competent, which I don't think, you know, excites people. (laughs) Right. But she's also very boring, which puts a lot of people off. It's the same speech over and over and whoever she's in front of or whoever she's speaking to, it's simply pandering towards those people. And I think that a lot of people, especially the people who I talk to, are starting to see that a lot more, that she's basically just a pandering politician. Yeah. So I think that as this uh, campaign goes on, 
uh, up until the uh, nomination, I think that people will definitely start to see that more. It's just, I honestly don't want Hillary to win the nomination. I mean, I'd rather vote for Hillary than uh, Cruz or oh, Rubio. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, I mean, Sanders has such a better track record, I think, with just social injustices. Um, he was at the march with Martin Luther King. I mean, granted, Hillary might not have been able to do that. She's probably a lot younger than that. Yeah. Um, but, you know, just his record throughout history has shown that he is a candidate who's not just there to pander towards people. He's the candidate who's actually standing up time and time again for the same things. And it doesn't really waver over time. Oh, yeah. I, I had a turning point um, in the debate last week after the forum. Mm -hmm. I, I've always like supported him on the substance, but I was I wasn't sure how he would fare in a general. And he's he's really impressed me. I think he's grown in performance at each debate. But that yeah. last debate, he held his own so well and had moments that were inspirational. And the biggest like positive for me was Hillary was clearly like jabbing him hard. Right. And it was a clear trap to get him to attack her. And then the media narrative was going to be, you know, probably uh, he's being a little too hard on a woman or something like that. Or Sanders and, breaks his word and attacks Hillary, something yeah, like that. Yeah, exactly. And that he saw through that, and not just that he didn't attack, he just used the time to where they wanted him attacked to reiterate his points. Right. It, it further highlighted that he has a driving ethic and she doesn't. Right. It, it, it was skilled, and it, it makes me believe that he could hold, possibly hold his own a general. So I, I think I'm definitely – he swung me in that last debate. I think I will definitely support him over Hillary. Yeah. The one thing about Bernie Sanders with the debates, since you had brought it up, um, I didn't like his performance at this last debate. I thought that he seemed too tired. He seemed a little nervous on what he should say. Um, but I think ultimately he did pull it off well. Just not mm -hmm. as well as he should have. Um, because his opening statement, it was kind of lackluster, I felt. It didn't have that same fire that he brings to the other debates. He kind of seemed tired from the road. And Hillary Clinton did too. I'm not saying that she did just fine. But yeah. they both seem kind of like worn down, I guess, as, as this has gone on. And there's still a lot of race to go. Mm -hmm. So maybe it was just an off night for him. But I didn't That's think that it was nearly as good as the other ones. Oh, huh, that's really interesting. I I didn't pick up on that, but like that doesn't mean anything. And I, like I don't know if if people thought like I did or you did. That's what's really interesting, <laughs> especially like that Republican debate. The the media is going crazy over Rubio getting called out by Christie. Yeah, the Rubio but, robot. Yeah, but like there was like a Google poll going, and he was second for winning the debate. Right. So who knows what the actual voters truly think while they're watching it, you know? Yeah, I mean, as far as the Republicans go, um, Rubio has been rising up in the polls, but he doesn't actually say anything. He does no. the same talking points over and over. And I had even said this during the first debate is he seems very robotic and he doesn't um, change his stance on anything. It's just we need to defeat Barack Obama and we need to press on. And this is what's wrong with the country. And I'm the only person to fix it. That's his answer for everything. Mm -hmm. And while it's a fair answer as far as Republicans go, with independents, he needs to give actual substance to what he's saying. You can ask him a question at any point during this race, and it's the same answer no matter what, with zero background to back it up. I, I think uh, you're definitely right, but I think he's kind of going for that invisible primary of the establishment candidate. Yeah. But I think can be smart like he's after to get over bush and Kasich and christie to get all that sweet sweet money <laughs> right. and then you can just drive those independents with the ads you can use from that money because right. like on actual substance and electrifying people i i don't think he's gonna beat trump or cruz so i think just like horse race politics wise i think he's playing the smart route yeah he's definitely playing traditional republican politics um, but the one thing is, I don't think that he is qualified to be a Republican candidate right now. Um, he's way too fresh into the political game. Um, and I know that there are some people who say, well, we want an outsider of politics. That's fine for a senator or a governor of a state or House Senate of your state. That's fine. 
But as far as the leader of the free world, you want somebody who actually has some experience in politics, not somebody who has experience with running the business because they're completely different. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's why, you know, Trump does well and a lot of Republicans gravitate towards that because they're like, oh, well, he's a businessman and he's going to make me more money. No, he's not. No Republican is out there trying to make you more money. They're trying to make them make more money. And that's the way it always goes. If you go to any CEO of a corporation, for the most part, and you're like, oh, who are you making money for? Well, I founded this company for myself and I want to make a lot of money. Well, what about your workers? They'll work for minimum wage. They're fine. <laughs> that's the same thing here. They even want to lower the minimum wage. So I, it boggles my mind when people support Trump and uh, Mitt Romney because they're businessmen. That doesn't mean they know how to lead a country. It's completely different. Yeah, I like I, I have a little bit of respectful disagreement on the Rubio experience thing. Um, be, I think he's like just as much experience as Obama did, and you could use that as a negative. I, like I, I probably <laughs> would, <laughs> but I, I think uh, I guess if you think the person is a good enough like manager of people. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if you would need that much experience because so much of it is delegation. Right. Um, like maybe I'm just being completely biased because I wanted Elizabeth Warren to run and she has almost barely experience and I would support her. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I like Elizabeth Warren. I don't think that I would have supported her, especially over Bernie Sanders. Um, just knowing their backgrounds a bit more, um, not more than you, just more than the average person. Um, I would rather have Sanders over Warren, but I'd rather have Warren over Clinton any day. Oh, yeah. And I don't think she would have ran. I think he ran after it was clear she wasn't. Like, I, I kind of get the feeling they're in the same corner. I, I think mm -hmm. he picked up the progressive wing when she wasn't going to run. Right. And she had a op-ed in the New York Times. Like, uh, I think Jane Uger talked about it, the Young Turks. and I, It was validating to see he picked up on the same thing. She was... Basically endorsing him without endorsing him yep, because absolutely. he wants to have yeah some influence if Clinton is the president. Right. And I mean, I could see if Warren would maybe join her cabinet, um, but I don't think that Warren would ever be her vice president. No. Um, yeah. Or maybe just an influence in the in the Senate. Yeah. Um, but uh, no, I definitely like that Chris Christie is attacking Rubio on his uh, robot semantics. Uh, it was hilarious, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I I honestly, with a Republican field, I don't want Cruz to be the nominee. I'd rather have Trump be the nominee. Yeah. I, 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 I think I agree with you. I'm not 100%. Okay, well, yeah, let's... no, I agree. I agree with you. Okay. So let's look at it this way. Um, with Cruz. He always wants to basically stomp on the First Amendment, get rid of the separation of church and state. He wants it to be a fully Christian-run nation. Trump wants to make money. He wants to make money for himself and his family and the people around him. Cruz wants the same thing, but he wants to dismantle a lot of what Barack Obama has done as far as like the Green Energy Program or uh, the Affordable Care Act. He wants to just get rid of those but not put anything in their place. I mean, we've created over 100,000 jobs in the past few years from green energy alone because of the green energy program that uh, Barack Obama has implemented. Um, no. What's that? Uh, yeah, like as you're saying that and I like, actually think about it, you're 100% right. Like right. Cruz is an ideologue. Trump, even though he's crazy and he's a complete racist. I, I think he is rational about like commerce and mm -hmm. he's even like liberal on some things like uh, health care and trade, trade treaties. Right. Um, but the one thing about Trump that a lot of people are saying, and you had brought it up that he's racist and he is a little crazy. I don't think that's true at all because uh, back in 2008, he endorsed Hillary Clinton. Uh, in 1998, he said that if he were to run for president, he would run as a Republican because Republicans believe anything. Hmm. So everything that he's done has seemed so calculated that for him to be, you know, just off the wall racist, I don't think that that would get him far in uh, his business career, let alone a political career, unless it was intended to be so. 
Look, you have a very great point. Um, I think what makes me say that, though, is uh, he has a history, even before the presidential election. Um, there was these, uh, I, I am sorry, I don't know the details, but there was these uh, black men that were accused, I think, of a rape. They were called like the Central Park Five or something, yep. and he took out like a full ad, very racially tinged. There's like uh, stories, uh, I don't remember the details, about his father had racial issues. I, I get the I get the feeling maybe it's not as big as his campaign campaign is amplifying it, but I do think he's probably a genuine racist. But yeah, I mean, I I do most agree Republicans that... probably are. <laughs> <laughs> I do agree that to an extent he is a racist. I'm not saying that he is is not by any means. Yeah. I mean, there's reports even of when he would go to visit his hotels. Um, he would make all the uh, people of color or different descent other than Anglo-Saxon, you know, white or, um, or Christian, basically, work in the back of the house where Trump wouldn't see them. Oh, wow, I hadn't heard that. Yeah, and it, that speaks very big volumes about him being a racist because, oh, let's, let's keep the darkies out of Trump's eyes. Let's make this a pure white world for Trump. And, uh, you know, after he would leave, then the, the people of color could go back to working their normal jobs. So I think that there is definitely something there about him being racist. But as far as his political career goes, he wouldn't have said that, oh, well, the Mexicans are rapists and murderers if it didn't get a more uh, headway in the polls. He wouldn't yeah. say that all Muslims are, are terrorists if it wouldn't get a more headway with the Republicans. He said that, I think, only to get more uh, ahead of the polls against, you know, Jeb and uh, Cruz. Yeah, I, I agree. A part, like a big part of his craziness is an act for that base. I definitely agree. Right. Um, what else here? I like, uh, it'll be really interesting if he wins the primary because I, <clears throat> I get the feeling that he'll probably tacked pretty hard left, not hard left, but more left than he is now right. in a general. But at the same time, the fact that he hasn't like completely done away with his what appear to be genuine beliefs on health care and uh, trade treaties, which would right. help him. Well, I don't know about the trade treaties, but the health care probably would right. in the primaries. It, it, I don't know. He's such a – he's some he's something that's so new and unpredictable. I, Right, and that's part he... of the whole appeal to it. That's why people follow him so closely. Oh, yeah. uh, and that's why he gets so much media attention is because he is so different. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you brought up a valid point about Trump going more left than what he is now in the general election. Mitt Romney did the exact same thing yep. uh, back yep. in 2012. Exactly. He was very far right, and then come the general election, they go, oh, well, Mitt Romney, your poll numbers aren't as strong as they need to be against President Obama. Okay, well, I'll tone down the things about abortion and I'll tone down the things about um, the economy, and we'll just talk about firing Big Bird. <laughs> <laughs> there was that famous, uh, I don't know if it was a tweet or it was a quote by one of his campaign staff that uh, after primary, the, the he's an Etch-a-Sketch, and you just shake him and you go to a general <laughs> election. <laughs> yeah, basically. Um, one of the, the things that is still up in the air is about Ted Cruz with stealing the election by saying that Ben Carson was dropping out. Oh, yeah. And uh, there's even some voicemails that people had received from Cruz supporters mm -hmm. telling uh, Carson supporters that uh, Carson has dropped out of the race and to go to your uh, polling places and tell other Carson supporters that he's dropped out to so go vote for Cruz. Wow. So that's a, a big reason why Carson has dropped out in the, the polls. Um, well, in Iowa, anyway. Yeah. But like, I mean, Carson's a dope anyway. Yeah, like, yeah, he has no hope in the world. But, I, like, I'm of two minds on that. Like, it's obviously, it's obviously really gross, and it could end up backfiring on him. But at the same time, it makes me kind of... Uh, fear him more or respect him more in terms of electoral prowess because mm -hmm. uh, sometimes like dirty games like that that are within legality work really really well yeah that and, but that raises a huge point of the advertisement game in elections 
is there's hardly any regulation, if any at all, on what a candidate can put out. Um, one of the really crappy things that Cruz did in Iowa uh, days before the election, um, well, the primary or caucus, I should say, is he sent out a mailer um, and it showed the person's name and their voter record turnout. And he gave them a score, like a, a report card. Except for he didn't just show that person's name. He showed the neighbors as well. Mm -hmm. And he basically said, hey, you need to come out and vote for me and you need to come out and vote. Um, I think that's a horribly crappy thing to do. I get it that that information is public records, but I'm not going to go to my neighbor down the road and look up his voter record. That, yeah. That's of no concern to the average person. It's just kind of a way to turn somebody against the other person and to try to influence other people. And it worked well for him, but I mm -hmm. think that people should see that snake in the grass uh, mentality. And honestly, I think that they should vote against him for tactics that he's been doing so far. Yeah, I think that's like a big story. Why people, why Demic, or sorry, why Republican primary voters don't see how much of like a gross oily snake oil salesman he is right because i remember the media like establishment media was really upset about that and made a big deal and it didn't seem to affect him all in the caucus mm. but like and again like he's even if he's not and he's not a good optics or even like speech campaigner right he's so oily and underhanded he's yeah. he's a force to be reckoned with but that's what I, I really don't get is that the voters of on the Republican side, they either don't see it or they choose not to acknowledge it. That's and a great point. It, it boggles my mind that you can vote for somebody so blindly to go, oh, no, 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 no. Ted Cruz, he says all these wonderful things. He doesn't give me points on anything, but he says that he'll do some things that are good for me. And I'm not going to do any research into it. And it boggles my mind that people in this day and age, 2016, aren't researching their candidates. I think you hit the, the nail on the head on something that's like really important in Republican voter mindset is they, they almost have a worldview that doesn't even acknowledge that objective reality exists. It's all for them all about symbols. Right. And even if he has no positives on substance he's good on the symbols trump too and mm -hmm. it seems to win a republican primary you need to be strong on those symbols and that's all that matters to them i think it's just a different type of worldview a different type of person right and i think that you know it boils down to how the voters on each side actually live their day-to-day -day lives because we look at the people on the democratic side and there's research being done by just the the voters left and right about what anybody says. If uh, Sanders comes out and says something that's horribly wrong, it's blasted over Twitter. If Clinton says something that's horribly wrong, it's blasted over Twitter. If uh, Trump or Cruz says something that's horribly wrong, eh, <laughs> it gets out there a little bit, makes some buzz amongst independents and liberals. But other than that, it dies off very quickly. But we... The, uh, I want to be careful about how I say this, but the people who vote for Republicans are typically people who are not doing as much research, mainly because of the way that they grow up. Uh, yeah. It's basically, oh, this is what I'm told. OK, I'll bow my head and I'll follow along with it mm -hmm. instead of going out there and research. But a lot of it is this old world mentality of whatever this person says that we look up to in almost a godlike fashion. They're right. And don't question it. No, definitely. Like, uh, yeah, and maybe this is a little bit too in the weeds for your podcast, but maybe maybe that's part of the psychology we're talking about stems from being a more religious people, right? Maybe and that's it, a side effect of that that affects your psychology if you're raised in that. Maybe that's pulling out of my ass. I don't know. No, no, no. You're fine. Um, but another part of the Republican voters is typically. They tend to be on the older side, more of the baby boomers. And yeah. if you look at uh, who Cruz actually talks to or who Rubio talks to or who Trump talks to, they're mainly talking to people 55 and older, usually always. And they're not talking to millennials. They're not talking to people who are in their 30s. It's mostly people who are about to retire or who have retired. And 
saying, oh, well, we need to protect your children. We need to make them have the same lifestyle that you did. Sorry, buddies, but the, the game has changed. We can't continue down that path. Well, the, yeah, that'll that'll be a, a, a big deciding factor in who is the Democratic nominee because it all depends on if the young people actually turn out, which right. – you know, really happened under Obama because of what that election meant of the first African American president, and he also appeared as you know really progressive, which he didn't end up being. But uh, right. Well, I mean, it's... I think that he deserves a lot more credit than what he's been given. Uh, and we're going off on a side note here, but that's completely fine. Um, he's done a lot for the country, and yeah, he's kind of been battling against Congress, but. He also hasn't had the spine that he's needed to as far as the president goes. But, I mean, I mentioned earlier he started the Green uh, Energy Initiative, which is one of the only programs that's actually profitable for the United States government. He started the Affordable Care Act, which is incredibly progressive. It's not geared completely towards the average person because the insurance companies are the ones who benefit. But it made it so that way hundreds of thousands of people who couldn't have gotten insurance before now get it. Um, so I think just those right there are pretty progressive points. But then you have the downside of the TPP, which is he, very not progressive. No, you make a good point. Like, uh, I, it is kind of a, a conundrum. The people who are on your side, you're almost more critical because you want them to do better than they right. have. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, me and my girlfriend have benefited, like, insanely from Obamacare. Um, yeah. She had seizures, which, if Obamacare had not passed, we probably wouldn't have had insurance on the time. So we would have probably hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt. Mm -hmm. So, like, you, you definitely make her a fair point. He deserves a tremendous amount of credit. But at the same time, I think you can give him credit, which I probably should do more. But then you can also expect more. And I I think you would agree with that. That's why Yeah, I, was, I, I like, absolutely do. I mean, as far as the way that we pulled out of Iraq um, with some of his trade agreement deals, um, not so great. The one thing that a lot of people I don't think give him enough credit for is the Iran nuclear deal. I think yeah, it's fantastic. Definitely. Um, and that's the one thing that really boggles my mind about Republicans. Uh, when I talk to them, is they don't understand what the Iran nuclear deal means. It means that Iran can't get a, nucle a nuclear weapon during the time frame of the deal. Mm -hmm. And if they try to get a nuclear weapon, then all the sanctions get placed back upon them. And they think that we're giving them billions of dollars. <laughs> this deal. Yeah, and, it's, and not, billion... it's not our money that we're giving to them. It's their money that we had frozen. Yep, exactly. <laughs> So it boggles and, my mind that people just don't research that, and the Republicans keep getting away with saying this over and over, and they should be confronted on it. Yeah, it's a double-sided game. Like Republicans lie so much or like distort the truth that it, they don't. The media doesn't take as much zeal as crushing them on lies as they do as Democrats because they do it so rarely. Right. But uh, like a. Uh, it's kind of – it's a mild point in favor of Clinton because I, uh, from what I understand, she was somewhat instrumental in at least beginning that deal. But at the same time, I don't Even think Jimmy Bernie Carter. would have been against that. You know, <laughs> Even Jimmy Carter or uh, Ronald Reagan or George W. Bush um, were instrumental in, in starting that agreement. It's been something that has been kind of talked about behind closed doors and – uh, very little over the years, and it's something that we would have had to confront in the near future anyhow, whether to allow Iran to remain kind of open but with sanctions to get a nuclear weapon, or do we just allow them to have an economy back so that way we stop uh, basically starving their women and children and just say, hey, you can have your money back, you can get back into the world economy, or uh, you can not. And here's some money to get started. That's your money. Yeah, that. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. Like, that is a good point. It was going to happen under a Democratic president anyway, just because right. they're sane and they, they don't want a <laughs> nuclear apocalypse. Right. This is like a complete tangent, but I think it's worth saying. Iran is such a like an interesting country. Like, I read somewhere that they're 
incredibly good on transgender rights, which boggles my mind. I, I'd like to learn a lot more about Iran, but anyway. They are it. more progressive on transgendered rights than one would think. Yeah, that's um, crazy. But they still also have strange laws, like if you're gay, you can still be executed there. Yeah, yeah. And they what, prove what is... that you're gay by having sex with you. <laughs> so <laughs> they're, like they're the... pretty backwards on that. But they that's do like... allow sex changes. They do allow that. Yeah. It's like the Turkey Army. You can be excused if you have a picture of you receiving gay male sex. Right. <laughs> what is that? It's just it's such a strange, strange culture, different but, culture. But a lot of things that with the Iran deal that people don't understand is this opens the door to Western culture in Iran. Yeah. Before it was completely closed off, and we've seen over the years that Iran gets more and more radical. But the same way that we defeated communism by introducing Western culture, um, people come over, they buy our, our jeans, and they go back to Soviet Russia. They buy our music, they go back to Soviet Russia, and they share that amongst the people. And whatever the propaganda is that's being told to them, that slowly arose over time. So the Iran deal opens up more than just trade. It opens up culture. And I think that will be one of the most instrumental tools to defeat the um, extremism in Iran. Definitely. I totally agree. It's a, it's insane to me that people, the only talking points I've heard against that ideal or that deal is just bullshit to try and have a more tense situation to benefit defense contractors. And Absolutely. I think it's like completely transparent. Yeah. Anybody who is against the Iran deal that has any power usually yeah. has ties to defense contracts, whether it's that they have shares in the defense uh, company or they have friends who own a defense company or um, any of the other number of things that would benefit them, like con campaign contributions. Um, they talk highly or highly against the Iran deal, but people who don't have so much or who are against the Iran deal, they're the ones who aren't going to benefit from a war with Iran. So, yeah, it is it is very uh, transparent with who's on what side and why. Definitely. Um, one of the, uh, the neat things that could actually hurt Sanders, um, going back to the main point here, about the uh, upcoming primaries, is on Twitter and other social media sites, um, a lot of people who support Sanders are starting to become borderline or very extreme sexist towards Hillary Clinton. And uh, Sanders actually came out today with a statement saying that, uh, that the Sanders boys, as they're called, they need to cut the crap. And I think <laughs> did you say, yeah. Did you say Sanders boys? Yeah. Yeah, that's what Sander Bros. Oh, Sander Bros. Okay. Bernie Bros. <laughs> Bernie Bros. <laughs> they need to be called Sander Boys. No, that's fantastic. <laughs> that is fantastic. But uh, yeah, he told him to cut the crap, and I think that's uh, that will help him out a lot. But oh. I think that it really could damage him because a lot of people will say, "Oh, well, this is the face of the Sanders campaign." You know, you have uh, sexist supporters, and if you don't want to be sexist, then don't support Bernie Sanders. Definitely. I think he, he, he took the exact thing he should have done. I, I think, again, I have two minds of this. I think it's kind of a Clinton political tactic. I don't doubt that this happens and exists at all. I think it's like probably like 5% of Bernie supporters on social media. Yeah. But, it, and again, I don't blame the Clinton campaign for using that. It's just smart politics. But at the same time, Bernie responded beautifully to it. Yeah. That you, if he had said, well, I think they're just exploiting 5% to blow us out of proportion, he would have been savage. The fact Absolutely. That was, yeah, smart enough to just say, don't do that. That's stupid. <laughs> this has nothing to do with sexism. I respect Hillary Clinton. Again, it's another reason I, I think he might be able to handle himself under an election. Beautifully handled. Yeah. And I'm I'm so, so surprised at just how well he's handled this campaign cycle, whether he wins or loses. Yeah. The way that he's handled this campaign has been fantastic. Um, yeah. Even with uh, the leak of the voter data uh, mm -hmm. before 
a couple of uh, debates ago um, where his uh, somebody on his campaign got a hold of the clincher voter data through the DNC, um, but the, supposedly they gave it back, and he handled that very well. Um, and I think that he deserves a lot more credit for that because he didn't just go, oh, well, no, uh, you know, I had told you guys that Hillary had been doing it to us the entire time. He goes, nope, uh, this person did something I didn't want him to do. Uh, I fired him, and that's that. Yeah. So. Yeah, but, but, yeah, brilliantly handled. It's it's. I am almost surprised the Clintons haven't been able to exploit his like just. If there's something wrong, even if, even if they're amplifying it, he doesn't acknowledge that. He just says, "Yep, that's wrong." <laughs> it, it seems like somehow politically you could use that against him, and they haven't figured it out yet. Right. Um, but I think that if he does win the nomination uh, for the Democrats, I think in the general election, every little aspect of him, and it should, uh, will get pointed out to being some kind of a monster. Um, but And that's – it happens to every candidate, but I think that Bernie Sanders has such a great track record so far that it will break down a lot of his supporters and go, oh, well, I didn't think of it like that. Um, so I guess it's kind of a moot point, but I just wanted to say it. Yeah, I think what's really interesting, like, uh, uh, I'm failing on the word, but a mind game uh, to play is to, like, zoom out and kind of put a blur filter and look at the candidates as kind of a low information voter is if you just see bits and pieces. Like, right. uh, Bernie seems, like, completely genuine. He seems affable. He seems charming. And he seems like he has that driving ethic of the game is rigged against you. Right. Clinton seems like uh, she's a, a strong woman. She doesn't really have a strong driving like point. She seems very ambitious, which mm -hmm. would have, I think, hurt her in the 90s. I think it's kind of a mixed bag nowadays. Right. Um, so there's... There's nothing like extremely like hurtful, but there's nothing extremely positive there. But then you like, if you apply that same filter to like Republican mm -hmm. um, candidates, I think Trump. I think he's massively underestimated. Like if you apply that blurred filter, you're half listening. He seems incredibly strong. He seems to truly believe right. what he's saying, and he seems like he's so angry and so strong that he'll change things. Right. I, I don't know how Hillary can handle that blurred filter in a general election. I think between – and the polls show this as well – that Hillary would get trampled compared to Trump. Um, but Trump is just so much stronger, and he has such a better online game than Hillary Clinton does. And that's really been a huge driving force for Trump so far is that his online game is fantastic. Um the other candidates have tried to dabble in it a bit, but Trump puts a lot of ads out online that are basically free for him. If you look at the total cost of what online advertisement towards um, TV advertisement goes, he saves a lot of money and reached a larger audience. I mean, it's the same reason why the Young Turks do so well uh, and have such higher um, rating numbers. It's because more people are turning towards online media, and if it's at their fingertips, they can just watch it whenever they want. And people talk, are, yeah, what's that? You're talking about like, uh, like he's paying like, like Google and stuff for online ads. No, just going on free sites like Tumblr and posting an online ad, or posting a short snippet on YouTube, or on Twitter, or even like his Twitter account. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get and what the you're other saying. candidates on the Republican side are just finally starting to realize, hey. This actually works. If I want to reach voters, I need to do this. And this was my main criticism towards Bernie Sanders when he first started his campaign. Uh, if you look back at his tw uh, Facebook history, it's mainly only text posts. There's almost no pictures at the start. And as it goes on, uh, about a month after he had said that he's going to run, he then started to post short little videos. He then mm -hmm. started to post pictures as well with his posts. And you see just how increased it is as far as traffic goes and yeah he's getting more exposure as time goes on but just those little itty bitty things of posting a short video or posting the picture make people want to share it that much more and make people go to your side that much more so with ted cruz 
who is basically only posting on Twitter and Facebook and only doing just very little on Tumblr or um, other sites, he's not doing as many videos as Trump. He's not doing as many pictures as Trump. So it, it bodes so well for Trump that he's doing these smart media tactics. And I think it's partly because he is a businessman. So kudos to him for having that and for having people who already know how to do this. But he's got the online game down packed. And I don't think that Hillary could even hold a candle to it. Yeah. And like a, like a, the term, I think it's called earned media. Mm -hmm. Like he just – he's the best in the history of all politics of that, of just yeah. – he says stuff and the media covers it like he, he almost doesn't have to spend a dollar. <laughs> yeah, like, and that's the thing. Good or bad, whatever he says, the media picks it up. And Carson can go out and he can say something, and it doesn't matter what he says. The media might go, oh, yeah, Carson uh, blabbed out of his mouth over here today. <laughs> but Trump, they air it, and they go over it all day long, and they analyze it. It's amazing. I think – I think Rubio could be more dangerous. Or I use that term, but more effective, I guess, if you're a Republican in the campaign than people give him credit for, because he he's got he's popular in Florida, I believe. Mm -hmm. he, he's Republican that happens to be a minority. I think that's a really strong position to be in. If he can consolidate the establishment support, I think he's. He's probably almost as effective as Trump, but but then again, he's such a wild card. I don't know. It's I it's so I see what you're getting at, but this election cycle, I think Rubio will be happy to finish in third. Um, I don't think he will rise to second overall. Um, I think honestly, it's between Cruz and Trump total. But as far as Rubio goes, I think next election cycle, if a Democrat wins, he will be a good front runner. Uh, but he needs to get away from his, you know, repetitive tactics. He needs to embrace online media. But I mean, I could be wrong. Yeah, like I could, I could definitely be wrong too. I could easily be wrong. It's, that's what's that, this one's so interesting. Things are changing. <laughs> yeah, for for better or worse, things are definitely yeah, changing. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to Citizen Speak. Again, my name is Garrett Martin. You can find me on Twitter at C-I-T-Z Speak. That's at Sit Speak. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Uh, if you want to hear other radio shows that are like mine, other podcasts, uh, you can go to michiganinternetradio.com uh, where you'll find a slew of all sorts of different topics to listen to. Really great podcasts over there. Again, go to michiganinternetradio.com and you can find me on Twitter at CITZSpeak. Thank you again for listening to Citizen Speak. Have a great rest of the day.